Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this year's CoSIG Forum. Uh, we have four speakers lined up today. First of all, we'll be kicking off with uh, Mr. Sihi uh, from Lexica, and he'll be talking about um, the theory behind vocabulary learning. Uh, and then we have uh, Mr. Hughes, Leander Hughes. Would you like to stand up? Sure, sure. <laughs> And uh, he'll be talking about coding and, and the joys it can bring to uh, English teachers. And then finally, we'll have a half an hour between myself and Oliver uh, talking about some um, online apps that we've made together. Um, if you look at the flyer, you can see the brief details of our presentations. Individual presenters might have their own handouts. I'm not sure if they do. Do you have any handouts? No? Okay. I do. Okay. But it's in your conference bag. In your conference bag, you'll find. It looks like this. <clears throat> it was in the conference bag. Um, it's the I suppose the important thing about it is it has contact information if you want to uh, get in touch with me and ask more questions or if you have interest in what we're doing, you can reach us there. There's also an explanation of it. Thank you. On the back of the flyer, you will find information about a call conference, which has now been scheduled and will be taking place in June next year in Matsuyama. Uh, please come along to that if you are able. And uh, I think we're almost ready to go. All right, that'll work. Okay. So, thank, thank you, you all. Yep. Uh, good online vocabulary principles and practices. Uh, my company makes an online vocabulary uh, tool or set of tools and applications. And uh, I was co founded with uh, Drs. Charles Brown and Brent Culligan. And everything we did was based on the research up until that point. And then after we launched it, we continued to monitor best research and our own data and feedback from users, both teachers and students, and modify it. And now, at this point in time, uh, I, I threw up this timeline. I won't go into it in great detail, but it's the first time I've done it. I organized the research that informed our work by date. And then I kind of laid over when the PC was invented, when the internet started, when online vocabulary systems started, and down here, these four papers are all based on our online vocabulary system. There are some others that have been written relating to, say, Anki or Quizlet and so forth. So now we're in, like, I would say the third generation. We had PCs, which made people think computers can help language learn. The internet, where suddenly we realized, wow, we can connect with students long distance. And then online vocabulary systems and the data collection. And now improvements are coming very quickly. So we expect to see a lot of good things changing. Good online vocabulary is a fast way to memorize the most important words you don't already know. Now, there are four critical elements to vocabulary study. There are probably more, but I think these are the top four. A fast way. Right? We all know that reading is a way to acquire new vocabulary, but flashcards, digital flashcards, are a faster way. Memorize. That's not a word linguists like to use, but in fact, we'll use acquisition or learn or anything but memorize. But in fact, we want automaticity. We want instant recall of high-frequency vocabulary, and that requires memorization. The most important words. That's an interesting subject, and we'll look into that carefully. What are the most important words for my students? Uh, and don't already know. That's interesting. Well, why would you want to study words you already know? That's kind of a waste of time. So we want to study words we don't already know. That's uh, advantageous. So let's first look at the fast way. The early systems informed by the research were based on paired associate rehearsals. I'm not going to go slow here. I'm going to assume that you're all up to speed on what I'm talking about. This is, after all, a call sick. So paired associate re rehearsals are the bedrock foundation of human knowledge acquisition. I mean, all human knowledge acquisition. And flashcards are the fastest, most reliable method. Basically, you know, the, you, you're all familiar with these cards. The words on one side, you turn it over, and the, the de description or definitions on the back side. Alternatively, it can be a translation. In digital format, it's the same thing. You see a word, you flip the card over, and you see the translation or the definition, and then you self-report, I knew it or I didn't know it, and sort the cards accordingly. Uh, an early system that we launched, and a, a number of the early systems in digital flashcards, 
basically did the exact same thing as the research recommended. See the item, ask do you know it, flip it over, yes I did know it, no I did not know it, and it sorts the card based on that. Unfortunately, this method doesn't work. <laughs> in practice, in reality, paired associate rehearsals, rehearsals, do not produce satisfactory results. And by that I mean retention. These systems only work for a small percentage of self-motivated learners. For example, if you have 100 students, and, and you probably do, and they all do the same number of rehearsals using this approach, uh, they're going to develop very different degrees of retention based on whether they were accurate, saying yes I knew it or I didn't know it, and whether they care at all about what they're doing. If they don't care, they're just going to yes, 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 see I finished it, and that's the problem. The fastest way in best practice is to have paired associate tasks. The difference between a task and a rehearsal is there are distractors. There are wrong answers you must sort from. All right? Now, effective distractors in be best practice are matched part of speech. So they're, you've got a target word you're trying to learn here, which in this case is munificence, generosity and giving or providing. And then you have two distractors or more. You don't want to fossilize the distractors. In, in our system, there are four or five distractors, and they randomly rotate. It's very time consuming to create distractors, but it is the best way. Distractors match by part of speech, syntactically matched or grammatically matched, and they have to be slightly more difficult or less well known than the target word. Otherwise, they can discount it because they know that's not the right answer. Well, that takes a lot of time. And the very best practice is a variety of paired associate tasks. So you want to have visual tasks, like the first one I showed. You want to have oral tasks, where they have to decide just by hearing the word. And you want to have contextual tasks. And then you run all of the vocabulary words they're learning through all the different forms of receptive processing. That builds the deepest and the strongest automaticity. Now let's talk about the second part, memorizing or acquiring. And um, the basic early research and the early systems implemented variations of Ebbinghaus, Mace, Leitner, and Pimsleur's work, recycling items at greater time intervals, okay? One day later, three days later, 10 days later, 30 days later, 90 days later, and if you get it right each time, it's permanently memorized. These are like hacks, brain hacks, for reducing the amount of time to transfer knowledge from short to long-term memory, okay? Now that's a pretty good approach. Unfortunately, it's not the best approach. And I only learned this through practice and, and hundreds of thousands of students and listening to the feedback. Analysis reveals that these six repetitions, new one, two, three, four, five, six, limits the total number of words that they can do in a time period, like a semester or a year. Because a lot of time gets spent reviewing words that build up in boxes six and five, uh, five and four. That means fewer new words are coming in during the limited time frame. And that means their net increase in subject coverage is going to be less. A lot of the people using our system want results. That usually brings people in. It's not like a research project. The, the dean is complaining about balling TOEIC or TOEFL's average scores, and they need to get results. So they want more coverage in a semester. In order to do that, we developed an express mode or an express protocol to space repetition. Standard protocol is six, six task reviews providing 99% permanent retention for 25 years. And 500 words per semester average is what the students are getting. Reduced by 1% is a net 495 per semester increase in vocabulary. In express mode, we cut off the last two reviews. The words just stack up in box three. You can switch to standard later and continue for permanent memory, but this one is going to net you an 85% likelihood of permanent retention. What that really means is words like this, plum, which is on every fourth TOEFL test, but is extremely low frequency in general English. 
So do I really need my student to memorize plum so that they'll know the meaning 25 years from now? Or can I perhaps satisfy my needs with two years of 100% recall capacity, and then afterwards, maybe 85% recall potential 25 years later? If I can accept that, then I can do 660 net new words per semester, not 500 or 495. So my coverage is going to be much higher. So this is a, an, an advantage for people who want to see faster results. And in TOEFL and TOEIC, when you think about this decision, just keep in mind one third of the vocabulary words in all parts of those two tests are very low frequency in general English. They're not of practical value to communications. They are specifically used on the test to be part of a difficult question, which they need for their scoring process. Okay? So that, I think, is now the best practice. Uh, now let's talk about the most important words. Early systems and the research suggested that corpus frequency analysis can be used to identify the high frequency vocabulary. I think we all agree with that. And that 3,900 high frequency words of general English can be expected to provide a learner with about 95% coverage of general English, the tipping point. Uh, Bhatia Lawfer and Paul Nation, nada, nada, nada. Keep that in mind, right? 3,900 words. This is how coverage increases the first 1,000 words. 75% of all English, the second 1,000 words adds only about 15 or 10 more percent. All words are not equal. But does typical corpus analysis include the frequencies of phrasal verbs or chunks? And I've asked uh, everyone who does corpus analysis that question. And I asked it because my clients asked me, does it include phrasal verbs? And the answer is no. no. Tom Cobb, uh, the BNC, and um, I think the best work is Mark Davies at BYU. When I talk to all of them, this is Mark, this is a quote from Mark, we don't do that because it would be very difficult. <laughs> and there's limited value in it. And these are researchers. They're not practical guys. Uh, I can assure you, we do do it, and I can assure you the very best practice requires counting idiomatic phrasal verbs. Get off. You can't suss the meaning from the two words individually. Cash flow is a poly word. You can figure out the meaning. You don't need to teach that separately or count it separately. But get off, you need to count, se count separately. In fact, there are more than 20 phrasal verbs in just the first 1,000 words of each of these uh, domains, general English, TOEIC, and TOEFL. And they're not the same. The, the 20 <coughs> phrasal verbs for TOEIC and the 20 phrasal verbs that are ultra high frequency words in TOEFL and TOEIC, only three are the same. So uh, you need to know them. So the best practice is to count those. And those are important, uh, just as single word units are important. Uh, a second best practice is that, well, sometimes teachers just want students to study specific sets of vocabulary that are relative to their class materials. Okay, so I don't have a class for TOEIC or TOEFL. I have my class, and I want my students to study the vocabulary that's in my curriculum that I've lovingly prepared over many years and proven is effective. So, okay, we do that. The best systems for doing that allows the teacher to just scan their curriculum materials, pull out the keywords they want, and send them, and then it's automatically put into a course for them. Lesser systems encourage teachers, like you guys, <laughs> to infringe copyrights by taking definitions from the internet, which is both time-consuming and unethical. I don't care if you don't sell it. It's somebody else's work. Now, if you take the definitions out of the internet and reword them, and look at three different dictionaries and write your own, that's cool, but that takes time. Now, the fourth part is words you don't already know. This gets really uh, complicated. I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. 
I'm going to reference here J.D. Brown. An accurate needs analysis is essential. Yes. I think we can all agree that a best practice for vocabulary needs analysis would be to determine which specific words each learner already knows and which specific words they do not know. We know which words they need from frequency analysis. So we don't want to teach them the words they don't know. Which words do they know and which words don't they know? So the, the state of the art is not the VLS or the VST. In fact, they don't work. They're, the problem with them is they're consistently wrong. If they were inconsistently wrong, they would have been thrown out years ago. But because they're consistently wrong, people keep trying to save them. But they cannot work. They, they, they have an inherent flaw in that they assume frequency and word recognition are correlated. They're on the same scale. So when you know a thousand words, you know the first 1,000 most frequent words of English. That is completely false. So the early research was suggesting word frequency assumed to correlate to word recognition. So on that basis, if you know 3,900 total words, 95% coverage, you know all of the first 1,000 most frequent words, all of the second most thousand, all of the third, and 900 of the fourth most frequent words. And you have 95% coverage of general English. However, according to the latest research, and this dates back to 2006, and published again in 2008, and then again in 2012, each word's likelihood of being known to the world at large can be ranked on a logarithmic scale. And these are eight words of 25,000 words in our database, but just these eight uh, are showing ranked from the easier word to the least difficult word. It's going to go up to zero and then it's going to keep going into positive territory on the 25. It's a logarithmic scale uh, centered around zero. Cultural is slightly easier than helpful, which is slightly easier than workplace, slightly easier than devil. You get the idea. But then if you look at the frequency counts on these words, they're all over the place. They don't line up. So just from eight words, which I selected at random, and has some phrasal verbs in it, in fact, break up with two meanings. As so a this is to Japanese learners or to native speakers? It's or different for Chinese people. Yeah, so the difficulty of words is different for native speakers, it's different for Spanish speakers in LA, yeah. and it's different for Japanese. These numbers are Japan, but right. we collect data from all the countries where people are operating. <clears throat> all right. So the research shows the correlation between frequency and likelihood of recognition or technically we call it the lexit. Some people call it difficulty, but that's very easy to misconstrue. Mm -hmm. So we'll just call it recognition. It's 0.61. Anyone familiar with statistics knows correlation of 0.61 is static on the radio between channels. It's meaningless. It sounds good, 60%, but it's meaningless. What's really happening, according to the latest research and practice, is that an IRT, item response theory, CAT, computer adaptive test, can determine which specific words are known and which specific words are not known. There's the research site. And here's what's happening. The 3,900 total word vocabulary is 946 from the first band, 823 from the second, 690 in the third. So you've got these gaps of missing high frequency vocabulary. What you really have with a total vocabulary of 3,900 words is 65% coverage, not 95. This is why your students, who are probably going to test somewhere between two and 2,500 known words in their freshman year, they have to read graded readers with 700 headwords or less, 600 headwords. They got 2,500 words, but they have to read here because they're based on frequency, the graded readers. Mm -hmm. They can't process the words they don't know. Okay. So, the best practice is to take a subject. In this case, we do IELTS, TOEFL, TOEIC, ACAN, General English. Do the test. The frequencies determine importance. The difficulty or the lexic determines whether they know it or not. It doesn't matter how high frequency the word is. 
we teach what they're missing. And we teach that in the order of frequency. So the most frequent word they don't know is taught first, etc. That is the best practice. Good online vocabulary, a fast way to memorize the most important words you don't already know. There I did it. We worked from the known applicable research, we critically evaluated that research, we built systems, as you guys do as well, we deployed those systems, and then we improved them based on real, real world feedback. And now we're at this very likely, uh, very nice point in time where people are using our systems to conduct research and we're getting even more specific feedback. Now, uh, I haven't mentioned this yet. I'm out of time. I'm going to finish the question. I just want to point out that uh, I've just entered into an agreement with Nihon Daigaku's computer science team. They are building serious games. And I've, I've known them for a while, and I'm, we're transitioning into the game world. We want to make learning games, because this is still work. As effective as it is, it's not fun. It's not self-motivating. Right? So we need to break that last barrier. Next year, I'll be talking about the best practice of motivation. That is the frontier. So I know uh, Furuchi-san in charge of the program. He's got teams. They're building games. They're junky games. I said, Masa, use my engine. Have your guys build fun game front ends and just connect to my APIs. It took us a little while to get the APIs cleaned up because it's like your living room when the guests don't come. When the guests come, you clean it all up. So it's all cleaned up now for public access. It's encrypted. They're building the front end. Cool. And now I've got another client going to do the same thing. So that's the future. Just hook up to my engine for a small monthly fee. <laughs> and build a good game. <laughs> we now operate in two ways. One is you just start studying, and then it automatically adjusts you. And the other is you can take the test if you're interested in their, their, seeing their score. So there you go. I'm finished. And if you have questions about these best practices, please ask. Yes? How much is your monthly fee? Nine hundred. Oh. Oh, for the, for the time? For, for the development uh, using your API. Yeah. For, for you know, games. Um, I, I know it depends. It probably depends on... On, on science, because right. um, we, right. we host the server that's running the engine. You uh -huh. guys, in this day and age, they're all apps. So yeah. the apps are being uh, published and then they hit the server. Yeah. So I need to know how much volume. So, so I have control of the server. The server is yeah. like my mm -hmm. contract. You pay me, I pay them. But it's all transparent. You see it. Uh -huh. With so Nihon Daigaku, we're charging them like 20,000 yen a month. OK. For, and I suppose you're getting some pretty decent usage on your server for that much. Like, I mean, they just started. This okay. is brand new. All right. Brand new. How many students is that, do you think? Using Nihon Daigaku? Yeah. Well, they're, they're planning to make two games. Uh -huh. And I've encouraged them to make both games access the same database. So you log into this game, yeah. same username, same password. You log into this game, same username, same password, access the same database. So if they get tired of playing fishy fishy, they can play <laughs> zombie. Right? And, and then that, that keeps the motivation high. In designing a game, most people don't think this way, but this is reality. Mm -hmm. You have to think in terms of time. That is the uh, variable that humans are locked into, a paradigm of time. So how long is the arc of this game? Is it a two hour, keeps me interested? Right. Is it a 50 hour game, keeps me interested? That's the big challenge. To make a game that stays interesting for 50 hours, it's a lot of work, <laughs> okay? Now, earlier I said you can learn by reading. You can learn vocabulary by reading. You can learn vocabulary by flashcards. Does anyone here have any idea of the relative speed of those two approaches? Like how many times faster are flashcards than reading? Are much faster, but take a guess. Six times faster. Six times faster. Anyone else? Twenty. Twenty. Okay. It takes twelve thousand hours. Kind of like the ten thousand hours in the Beatles. It takes twelve thousand hours to learn all of English. Nine years, three and a half hours a day, no breaks, or a lifetime of going to school, K through twelve. You want to learn all 7,500 words of TOEFL? 12,000 hours by reading authentic, unsimplified materials. If you want to learn those same 7,500 with digital flashcards, 12, uh, one, what is it? 100 times faster. 120 hours. So you maybe have to have a game that's interesting for 120 hours. Tall order. 
So I, that's why I've been encouraging interchangeability, just different front ends, keep playing, keep acquiring vocabulary. Any other questions? Well then, thank you very much. Thank you very much.